everyone. My name is Selma Rosenthal. Um, I live in Onondaga County. And this project on non-native buckthorn started a few years ago when I was walking along the Erie Canal in my home, near my home. And I saw this buckthorn that had leaves that are a little longer and more narrow than I think of for Rhamnus cathartica, the European buckthorn. Some people also call it the common buckthorn. And at first I thought these were just sprunt, uh, stump sprout leaves. Um, you know, when you cut a bush back, uh, all, that, all those roots are still there and that extra energy goes into making bigger leaves. Uh, but when I walked past it in autumn, I noticed, well, I still noticed those longer leaves. And I took a look at the fruit and I had my aha moment when I said, this is definitely not European buckthorn, Rhamnus cathartica. I only saw two or three stones for fruit. And the pulp was yellow and it had this really strong cat pee odor. Um, so I checked some of the local flora that cover this area and it didn't key out, mostly because my two other options, a plant called Dehurian buckthorn and a plant called Chinese buckthorn, supposedly only had two stones. And then I got confused. Um, I noticed some of the stones were round and filled and some were this lenticular lens shape. So I wasn't sure, am I supposed to be counting those? Or do those you know, not count? Maybe that's how you get to two. Um, so I noticed some other features. I noticed um, that I could identify more than my one mystery bush uh, because I noticed they turned yellow sooner than adjacent uh, European buckthorn. And I also noticed when I broke a twig that there was this bright yellow color. So I confess, I kind of gave up and I asked um, a fellow who's working on the floor of New York and I said, I can't figure this out, what is this? And I got a very, very nice email back that said, yep, we know that these exist, but we don't know what they are. And I thought, cool, how often do you find a plant that you can't be identified? Um, and perhaps I should have left it well enough alone. But the thing is, once you see these, you can't unsee them. And everywhere I, I started walking, I would notice them. And I thought, well, how hard can it be to identify a plant? Maybe if I just look at a flora to where the Chinese buckthorn and the Dehurian buckthorn are native to, which is China, and I look at closer descriptions of the European buckthorn with all these different characters that I'm noticing, uh, perhaps I can make a little bit of progress on figuring out what my mystery bush is. So my talk today, I'm going to make sure we're all on the same page. We know what European buckthorn looks like. And then I'm gonna show you what the Dehurian buckthorn looks like, what Chinese buckthorn looks like, what a hybrid might look like, and then tell you what I've learned about this project in the way. So one of the things that I did know is that it was not the native buckthorn, the alder leaf buckthorn, that only grows in bogs and fens. Um, and this was growing along, as I said, the old Erie Canal near water, but pretty dry ground. I also knew it wasn't the glossy buckthorn, which has the same buckthorn name to it, but is otherwise in a different genus. Um, but it's a useful plant to know what it looks like in case you have it on your property. So I'm gonna describe that to you. And then we're left um, with these three options. So as I said, so that we're on the same page, glossy buckthorn uh, used to be in the genus Rhamnus, the same genus as the European buckthorn, um, but it's been put in its own genus Frangula uh, for a number of reasons. For one, the buds, are what we call naked. They don't have bud scales. And I'll show you what bud scales look like in the European buckthorn in a moment. There are no teeth to the leaf margins. So the edges of the leaf don't have any little serrations or teeth. And there are also a lot of what we call secondary vein pairs. The main vein is the one that goes from the base of the leaf to the tip of the leaf. Those side veins are the secondary vein pairs. And you can see there are a lot of them. The European buckthorn supposedly only has two or three. Uh, some plant keys say could have up to two to four. 
Uh, the flower parts in Frangula are in fives, whereas in the European buckthorn in the genus Rhamnus, the parts are in fours. And you can see the fruit there. Um, the flowers open sequentially along a shoot. So those, uh, which means that the fruit are going to mature sequentially. So those dark blackish, bluish fruit, they do look a lot like European buckthorn, the one that we have all over the place here in New York. Um, but you can see if I were doing a nature journal, I would make a note that my, the colors in this photo are true um, in that in addition to that dark color, you can see red, white, or light greenish fruit on a glossy buckthorn. Um, so if you do have this on your property, it can be quite weedy and invasive as well. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. So let's make sure we all know what the European buckthorn looks like, because maybe my mystery bush is just a, a bush that's got kind of some weird properties to it, but is otherwise fits um, a lot of the description for European buckthorn. Leaves grow on long shoots, and they can be opposite, alternate, or what we call sub-opposite, slightly askew. They can also grow on short shoots, where the stem is a little stubby nubbin, and the leaves look like they're coming out of a single cluster. When I talk about leaf length, um, I'm talking about a leaf along midway along a long shoot, or the longest leaf on a short shoot. Uh, the twigs usually don't have any color to them when you break them open. Um, you can have leaves with uh, hairs or without hairs. Uh, the bud scales you can see there, they have a little fringed margin to them. And the bud shape, they can be curved. That's what gives the name in English, the buck part to buckthorn. Um, and you can also see where the thorns come from uh, right there in between the buds. You can also find thorns in the axles of the twigs. And then we also have this little plant part called a stipule. Um, and I mention that only because it's going to be important when we distinguish European buckthorn from Chinese buckthorn. The stipules usually fall off shortly after flowering. And in the case of European buckthorn, they're short, they're less than half the length of the petiole. The petiole is that stalk that the leaf blade sits on and connects it to the stem. So just keep that in mind as we, as we move forward here. Uh, the flowers, we've got the styles are divided into three or four parts. That's what gives us three or four stones per fruit in the European buckthorn. The pulp is purple and it's got a sweet smell to it. I think almost kind of like a grape um, and the fruiting pedicels, the little stalk that the fruit is connected to the stem with, tends to be about six to 10 millimeters. And bear with me here, there's a lot of detail that you probably never uh, thought you would need to know, but it turns out these are features that are important in distinguishing uh, these buckthorn species. And then the leaves can be varied. Um, they can have that little tip to them. Uh, they can be glossy, not glossy, dark green, light green, sort of more of an olivey green. The leaf undersides can be whitish or tannish or light greenish. Um, but for the most part, um, they are less than twice as long as wide. So they're kind of, if you did a measurement leaf length to rate uh, width to leaf length to leaf width, um, you're going to be less than two. So in short, we have our European buckthorn that um, many of us have pulled from our gardens or tried to remove. So now you can see my mystery bush here, why this jumped out at me as being not uh, European buckthorn. And as I said, there are a number of characters here that are different, uh, which is why I thought if I go to some of the other plant florids, I should be able to make some headway into figuring out what it is. Um, so I started taking a closer look at some of the other bushes I could find near me in Onondaga County. And I could find some that were pretty long leaved with long and narrow leaved. I could find some that were short, so they fit the characteristic of European buckthorn and leaf length, but they were pretty narrow. Um, some had very short petioles as well as long leaf blades. Some had yellow hairs. 
Uh, some had a lot of secondary vein pairs. And in addition to that bright yellow that I noticed on my mystery bush, I could find blue pulp and this sort of in-between greenish brownish color. So in addition to um, the two species that I found in the floor for New England, the Dahurian buckthorn and the Chinese buckthorn, I also thought I'd better go back to some old garden catalogs and see what was available for gardeners and arborists uh, to be planting in our area. Um, and pretty much came up with a short list, which included just those two species. There are other buckthorn, like Japanese buckthorn, uh, that I excluded for various reasons uh, based on flower and fruit characters. So I came up um, with this list, either my mystery bush was a, a Rhamnus cathartica or some variation of it, a Dahurian buckthorn, or perhaps a hybrid with the European buckthorn, which I didn't, couldn't find any references to in the literature, by the way, or it was my Rhamnus utilis, which is the Chinese buckthorn, or a hybrid. So let's take a look at these three groups, um, and specifically this uh, reference I found to Rhamnus cathartica variety diverica. And when I looked at some herbaria specimens, um, I thought, wow, this is really what my mystery bush looks like. Two to three stones, um, some leaves are long and narrow. Um, I thought I was set. Uh, of course, the problem was that um, even though Mr. Maximovich made a great description, um, he also included this other variety called Intermedia, which is sort of closer to Rhamnus cathartica than it was to um, his Rhamnus variety diverica. So I, I wasn't really sure I could distinguish the two. And although I could find other plants that look like this, um, it turns out that these two variety names are no longer considered to be acceptable names. There's um, any, uh, as those of you who have worked with uh, species names know, there's a list of, uh, of acceptable species. And someone before me has decided to elevate these varieties into their own species, Rhamnus diverica. So you and I can agree or disagree with that, but we need to understand why it, people considered it and their own species, and then we can decide what, what we want to call it. So let's take a look at what Rhamnus diverica looks like. Well, I was able to find two herbarium specimens, both of which were collected here in New York. Um, the one on the right, I um, can't quite remember, 1916, I believe, near Ithaca, New York. And the one on the left, it turns out, was collected here near Syracuse, New York in 1925. So I thought, cool. Um, it was collected in a cemetery. So I went to the cemetery. I talked to the groundskeeper. They said, no idea what I'm looking for, and the deer have probably eaten it. Um, but as, as I mentioned, in autumn, these are quite distinct. So I was able to actually find a bush that had two or three stones, look just like this herbaria specimen. Um, but I ran into another problem, which is that Rhamnus diverica um, was first described, unfortunately, in a very, very short description, where he said that it was a bush that was thornless, had only two stones per fruit. Um, and then somehow over, when you go through the literature, people have kind of ignored that and said, Diverica can have thorns and it can have two or three or two or three or four stones. Um, so I wasn't really sure what Diverica really is. Um, but what I could find were plants that were sort of in between the European buckthorn and the Dahurian buckthorn. Um, so this plant here uh, had the long fruiting pedicels that were characteristic of Rhamnus diverica, but it had three or four stones and it had the purple flesh. Um, so again, these characters um, are coming up in between Rhamnus cathartica and Rhamnus diverica. I could also find variations, um, plants with long leaves, long fruiting pedicels, it would be characteristic of Rhamnus diverica, but they had three or four stones, and in this case, yellow pulp. Just more variation. Um, and at this point, I was sort of thinking I have a hybrid swarm here. 
between Rams Cathartica and Rams Diverica. So it turns out Rams Diverica has another subspecies, the subspecies Nipponica. Uh, Nipponica was actually first its own species, Ramnus nipponica, and then it got demoted to Ramnus diverica subspecies nipponica. And its claim to fame is simply that its leaves are longer and more narrow than Ramnus diverica. Um, and the only reason I'm really mentioning this one is because I was able to see some of these. They were described by Pratt in 1980 um, in a little park outside of West Hartford, Connecticut. And I went there and sure enough, I could find some bushes there that did not look like European buckthorn. Um, and two things to note, one, uh, the pulp was all red. I could find pulp that was that sort of yellowish color, but it's more of a lime kind of yellowy. And those are really the, un that's an unripe fruit. Even the European buckthorn in fruit that's unripe will have that yellowy color. So when I'm talking about uh, pulp color. I'm talking about mature fruit. Um, anyway, these uh, plants uh, pretty well fit the description of Ramnus diverica subspecies Nipponica. And as I looked around this park some more, I could find Ramnus cathartica and I could find bushes that looked just like my mystery bush, bush that had leaves that looked like cathartica but had mostly two or three stones. Some had the blue flesh. Um, so I was still thinking that I might have a Ramnus diverica, Ramnus uh, cathartica hybrid, but I wouldn't be able to distinguish between these subspecies, which is okay. Um, but I've just part of my learning process here, trying to figure out what my mystery bush is. Um, I just wanted to show you these long fruiting pedicels that were described for uh, the Dehurian buckthorn. They are quite distinctly long. It's not just that one or two are long, they're all long. So they were, they're pretty distinct and very different than the European buckthorn. However, the other thing I wanna show you is these short petioles. Um, and just keep this one in mind when we come to Chinese buckthorn. I found a bush down near Ithaca with these long, mm -hmm. narrow leaves um, and almost exclusively two stones, although there were some three stones in there. And the interesting thing with this bush is that had I not seen the bushes in Connecticut, I would have called this one the Ramnus diverga subspecies Nipponica. Uh, these were longer and more narrow than any that I saw over in Connecticut. Um, so just as the European buckthorn can have a lot of variation in leaf shape. Um, I would have to say that the Dehurian buckthorn also has a lot of variation in leaf shape. Um, so to be complete, I need to look at the Chinese buckthorn. So let's take a look at those. Uh, Chinese buckthorn's claim to fame is that it's got long narrow leaves with really short petioles. Uh, which is a little problematic because, as I said, the Dehurian buckthorn that I found in Connecticut had really short petioles as well. Um, those stipules that I mentioned for the European buckthorn that fell off sh uh, shortly after flowering, because of the short petiole length, that stalk from the leaf blade to the stem, you can see that the stipules are longer than the petioles. And in the literature, that's one characteristic or way of identifying these plants. They also supposedly have yellow hairs, um, especially on young leaves. Uh, but someone has come along and noted that in the US, uh, the hairs are white. We have Ramnus utilis forma utilis, and that's how taxonomists have gotten around the fact that the hairs in the US on Chinese buckthorn are white, not yellow. And the other feature is that on herbarium specimens, people have noted that the leaf underside of the blade can have a very yellow or goldeny type color. So, and this, um, I was able to see this on a specimen um, that I collected near the University of Connecticut in stores. Um, and this little seedling was growing the location where there had been a Chinese buckthorn that has since been removed. Um, but that's how I 
I believe I know that that's a Chinese buckthorn. So it turns out that um, some folks in, at University of Michigan were able to study um, the Chinese buckthorn and European buckthorn hybrids. Uh, it's a great study. They had found one Chinese buckthorn, and then they studied a swarm of buckthorn around there, some of which had features closer to the Chinese buckthorn and some of which had features closer to the European buckthorn. And you can see in that picture on the far right how short those petioles are, the, the stalk at the base of the leaf blade. However, when I looked at their herbarium specimens, you can see that those plants kind of start to look like my mystery bush again, right? Those petioles really aren't that short, and those leaves look kind of like the leaves I found here in Onondaga County. And um, right, and especially that top uh, right photo with the really short blades, that would be very characteristic of Chinese buckthorn. And that yellow hair on the bottom left on the leaf blades, that's still a mystery to me as well because the yellow hairs on the Chinese buckthorn were described as being on the, the leaf underside on the, the primary vein and along the secondary veins. Whereas the yellow hairs that I was seeing was actually on the leaf blade, on the underside of leaf blade. But I found no references whatsoever for Ramus cathartica having yellow hairs. Um, so I, I just don't know if, uh, when I first saw the yellow hairs, I was very excited and I thought clearly what I have here in Onondaga County is a hybrid between Ramus cathartica and uh, the Chinese buckthorn because of that yellow hair. So I went to Ann Arbor. Um, the original site where this study was done back in 1990 was a, near a place called the Leslie Nature Center. They have worked very hard to remove buckthorn from their property through prescribed burning and pulls. So I wasn't able to find anything that looked like a buckthorn there, or at least one that I wanted to see. I wanted to see something like the Chinese buckthorn. Uh, but after walking through many beautiful little city parks in Ann Arbor. I found one across the river uh, where I found these uh, long, narrow leaf buckthorn. And you can see they have long fruiting pedicels. So had you just shown this photo to me or shown me this bush, I would have said, looks just like the ones in Connecticut that were described as uh, the Dehurian buckthorn, that, that subspecies Neponica. Um, so I hope by now you guys are thinking, what's the next slide going to show? I'm going to, yeah, how many stones does this bush have? That's really what, what the, uh, seems to be a very defining feature. Well, uh, the stones were all three. <laughs> so they were not two or three. I couldn't find any with two. Uh, I couldn't find any with four. Um, and to be fair, um, I also had trouble reaching a lot of the fruit and there were not a lot of fruit on these bushes. So I probably would want to go back and, and really sample these more. Um, most of them had red pulp, but I did find one with yellow pulp. Um, so um, I, you know, obviously it's proximity to a plant that had been identified as being Chinese buckthorn. Um, would indicate that it, it may well be a hybrid, um, but I, for all I know, someone planted a Dehurian buckthorn on the other side of the river. Um, and this was just to remind you that sometimes in photos that leaf petiole can look very short. Um, the photo on the left, I was trying to measure leaf length and petiole, um, and that little stalk at the base of the leaf looks pretty short. But um, when you actually uh, look at the leaf flat, you can see that those petioles aren't that short. And certainly there was no goldish color on the leaf underside, uh, which is, would be perfectly expected if these were hybrids. Uh, so the authors concluded that these Ramus cathartica, Ramus utilis hybrids can look a lot like Ramus diverica. And I would certainly agree with them <laughs> Um, the beauty of their project was that they were able to find a mature, older Chinese buckthorn so that they knew in their hybrid swarm what they had was the Chinese buckthorn. 
Unfortunately, here in Onondaga County, my mystery bush, I have not been able to find any bush that has only two stones or that has um, features that are only those associated with the Chinese buckthorn. So I wanna show you one more bush. This bush I found um, here in Onondaga County, kind of in the middle of nowhere off of Route 20 at a, a DEC fishing, fishing uh, parking lot. And what I first noticed is the number of secondary vein pairs on the leaf underside. Um, so I cut a fruit open and you can kind of see there, that's gonna be two filled and two unfilled stones. So two of those rounder stones and two of those more lens-shaped stones. So we've got four. So this is a Rhamnus cathartica, the European buckthorn. Um, I noticed that the fruit shape wasn't quite circular and I had read that that's a feature of the Chinese buckthorn. Um, the nice thing about working with a non-native invasive plant is it doesn't take much to get permission to cut a piece and bring it home. So I took a twig home and I checked um, for yellow hairs on the leaf underside and I found none. But I'd taken all this trouble to make these measurements on it. So I threw it into my herbarium press, um, not really thinking much more about it. And I was just floored when I opened up my press and I saw these beautiful gold leaf, uh, gold yellowish uh, color to the leaf underside. So you're, I, my first thought was, this may well be a hybrid between the Chinese buckthorn and the European buckthorn. And um, its proximity to nothing but cornfields is a little puzzling to me. Um, so then you have to step back. And, and at this point, I just want to step back and say, why do we care about all this? And what does all this mean? Um, and perhaps all that I have here is what I would call an accidental variation to the European buckthorn. Um, only time will tell if this feature, this golden leaf color, will propagate and be found in offspring from this bush, or if this variation is going to die out with this bush, and then it's, it's nothing more than a variation to the European buckthorn. So what does all this mean? Um, I think I can find buckthorn that actually fit the description of buckthorn with small leaves. Um, most of the leaves around me in Onondaga County are actually larger than fit any of the descriptions in the plant keys. Um, so there is room for some, perhaps some updating in the plant keys and plant descriptions for the European buckthorn. Um, I think it's kind of fun. I think we have a little microevolution going on before our very own eyes. Um, and unfortunately, I think buckthorn are here to stay. Um, I think we have a pretty large gene pool here on a species that plant taxonomists will call it's a young species. There are a lot of, of characters that are still changing and evolving. Um, and it seems to be quite adaptable to different climates and different um, uh, degrees of soil wetness. Um, but what, what we'd really like to know and what was so helpful with that study in Michigan, were they able to document that there was a Chinese buckthorn um, in right there and then they were able to study the hybrids, is to know where these plants with the two or three stones, where are they? And this is where I'm hoping you folks can come in and help. Um, oops, I hit the wrong button. Um, I made up a table to help identify these. Um, and I realized it's awfully detailed and I have a lot of many's, usually's, mostly's in there. And that's what happens with hybrids. They, some of these characters may turn out uh, not to be useful in determining species um, and some of them may, but we're still learning about this. But what I really wanna know is where are the bushes that have three to four stones um, that's common for the European buckthorn and where are the bushes that have only two or two to three stones um, because it's in those areas that we might expect say 100 years from now to have um, a new species emerge you know we just don't know or are these going to die out um, yeah sorry I keep hitting the wrong button but I guess that is the next button yeah 
So that's pretty much um, what I wanted to share with you. I'm happy to take any questions or thoughts, if anyone has any. Wow, thank you. Thank you. That was really impressive how much detail and effort you put into that research. Thanks. Thanks. Agreed. Amazing. Uh, so there are a couple of questions. Put a couple of people on mute. Yeah, I mean, the something. other thing I can I can add is that, you know, as master naturalists, we tend to want to identify what we're looking at. Um, and then we have to remember that sometimes. Uh, they, it's just not possible. There's a lot of variation. Um, so when you're using the apps like iNaturalist, um, my mystery bush just says, you know, European buckthorn. Um, but what I should do is if I were going to use iNaturalist to identify it, you know, really take advantage of that comment section and say, looks like European buckthorn, but the leaves are kind of long and narrow and, you know, and measure them. And then someone down the road can go back to that area if they want to. Um, Great, thank you. We're gonna, I'll read a couple of questions, but I wanna know, did you travel to Ann Arbor just to look at this buckthorn? <laughs> so it turns out I have family that live in Ann Arbor. I also have family that live in West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so I was uh, fortunate to be able to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, there's a population of these um, up in St. Lawrence County near uh, SUNY Potsdam, and unfortunately I have no family up there, <laughs> so I have not been able to go up and see that population, but sometime I would like to go up and take a look at those. Um, and definitely with these hybrids, it's important to really take a very broad view of where these plants might be occurring. Um, had I restricted this little study to just New York, um, it would have been great, but I would have missed some opportunities. So you just kind of have to go where the where the plants take you. Good advice. Um, Matt and Linda said, impressive sleuthing. Are there any buckthorn varieties that are not considered invasive or undesirable? Well, our native buckthorn, the alder leaf buckthorn, um, it's located in uh, very wet areas, little bent fog, uh, bogs and fens. Um, so that's a native one. Um, and then there are, turns out there are like over 150 species of buckthorn, uh, but many of them occur in California and the Midwest and down in Mexico. And then of course, there are a lot that occur in China. Um, the European buckthorn uh, is native to Europe and uh, the Northern tip of Africa, uh, but they've actually done a very good job of eliminating most of their buckthorn. Um, Uh, let's see, I think it's Dave Shepard asked, does, oops, it's moving around. does the literature regard hybridization between different buckthorns as common or not so much? Right, so, um, you know, this is where the fun begins in defining what a species is and what, what a hybrid is. Um, but I think part of the reason that the literature is um, a little confusing and the last monogram, a monograph to the genus. So a monograph is when you, uh, a plant scientist will take one genus and really study it and study the literature and then update everything you know. Um, and the last one for the genus Ramnus was done in the 1940s. And it's got a bazillion different buckhorn species in there, many of which um, uh, just don't occur anymore. Um, so there's desperate need for someone to go through and worldwide take a look at all the different buckthorn and decide which are species and which were just kind of um, unusual variants that back in the day someone called a species. Uh, but definitely it's considered to be a young genus where there are a lot of hybrids probably occurring. Um, being the non-native invasive plant that it is, uh, I don't think you could argue there's not a lot of need to do genetic work on these to figure out who's related to who, because in the end, we're just, we really should just be pulling them. Um, the fruit on these has, people have looked at that and it's not as nutritious for birds as our native species. Um, 
So we definitely do want to be pulling them, except for the ones that I'm studying. <laughs> Well, that leads to another question. Steve Kinney had uh, said, great detective work. Do all the buckthorn species have fruit that have low nutritional value for birds and that cause diarrhea that's accounting for its rapid spread? Well, certainly that's the cathartica. Um, the populations that I've seen down near Ithaca and in Ann Arbor and in Connecticut um, are definitely pretty weedy and invasive. Um, and I don't think anyone's actually studied uh, their nutritional, nutritional properties. The Chinese buckthorn uh, was originally planted uh, back in China because of that yellow dye uh, was used in the silk industry. It makes a really color fast dye for yellows, blues, and greens. Um, so that's why they were planting it. Uh, the species, the Dahurian buckthorn and the European buckthorn, uh, they were brought over here mostly as ornamental plants but also because the uh, European buckthorn made a great hedge grow. If you trim it, you don't get as many fruit. Um, it'll keep your livestock in or out, depending on which side of the head you're on. Um, but of course, nowadays we don't trim them. We just let them grow in our hedgerows. And yeah, so we get that fruit that's not desirable. Um, Thank you. Um, Tracy asked if you could show the previous slide again. Sure thing. This one? I guess so. Tracy, is that what you wanted to see? Um, as I said, this is sort of a work in progress table. Um, the more I see these, I kind of update my table a bit. Um, but it's definitely got a lot of mosts and usuallys and many's in there. Um, and sometimes that happens in science. We can't pin, pin, pin things down as neatly as we would like to. Um, but in looking for these, I found them in places uh, like cemeteries and churchyards and university campuses. Um, interesting enough, the ones that I've seen have all been not too far from a plant called the Amur honeysuckle, another non-native um, invasive honeysuckle bush. I think people who back in the day purchased Amur honeysuckle probably got a good deal on Dahurian and Chinese buckthorn as well, because uh, I do find them um, in similar locations. Oh, that's interesting. All right, great. Thank you so much, Selma. Um, oh, we'll see. So tell us again, what can we look for or do to help your continued study, Steve? Can you? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so the big thing is um, either in the spring when these flower, in Onondaga County, they flower uh, the last week in May, the first week in June. Um, just take a look at a branch and take a look at those styles and see if they're divided into three or four parts or if they're divided into two or three parts. That's a really simple way. And that's really the first cut to finding a plant that um, may be something other than just a, what I call accidental variation of the European buckthorn. Um, that would be really cool. I would love to find a bush that has only two stones. Uh, right now, the Chinese buckthorn, the literature says it's only got two stones. And yet, I look at herbarium specimens and I can see three. <laughs> so there's some, there's some wiggle room there on um, exactly what Chinese buckthorn looks like, but it would be cool to find a bush that had only two stones, because um, then we know it's probably not a hybrid or what we call an intergrescent, where um, the next generation plants start to hybridize back with the parents and you can get all sorts of interesting variation and combinations of characters. Um, yeah. And then of course in autumn, if you're gonna look at the fruit pulp, um, I, I always am careful. Um, back in the day, the European buckthorn pulp was used to make something called a ramnus syrup. Um, they use that as uh, sort of a constipation aid. Um, but we now know that that pulp property can have some carcinogenic properties to it. So I just caution you not to really touch the pulp when you're trying to look at pulp color or if you're trying to count the stones. Um, and those little lens shaped stones, they can be very thin. So you really have to take that fruit and kind of squish it around to make sure you separate the skin from the stones when you're trying to count the stones. And I would recommend if you can reach them, count at least 10 stones to get a good idea of variation. 
because um, sometimes in these bushes that have only two or three stones, you can find an occasional four, fourth stone in one of them. Um, you would think that these putative hybrids wouldn't have many fruit that, you know, they, um, but, they but they do. So uh, that's partly the problem of buckthorn. It, it uh, does bear a lot of fruit. Well, okay, um, Selma, would you mind typing your email address in the chat box? That way, if people do uh, a little sleuthing of their own and want to contact you, they'd have your contact um, info. I would love to if I can figure out how to get to my chat box. <laughs> okay, and then oh, in the meantime, there's one more question from Adrian Are you looking only in your county or all of New York State? I would love to know. I, um, all of New York State. Um, one thing that we are pretty sure of is that these are more commonly avail um, spread around New York than is currently reported. Um, and that's simply because most people consider them European buckthorn, because a lot of them look just like European buckthorn until you count the stone number. So yeah, I would love to know where else in New York um, they are occurring. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I hope that we can contribute to your work, your good sleuthing work. And thank I hope you. that you get to the other places, meet, meet new friends in other places so you can go sleuthing some, <laughs> some do yeah. some additional sleuthing. Yeah. And I will certainly remind Christy to remind everyone to look for me come end of May. <laughs> so thank Great. you very I'd much. I'd be happy to do that.